Greetings once again in that name that is above every name, for the Bible declares that at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow and every tongue must confess that he is Lord. Oh, how blessed we are, how wonderful it is to be here on this wonderful Lord's Day. We are so delighted that you would share with us a man and a man what a wonderful day that God has given us and you know what it's a good day to worship the Lord let me say that again I said it's a good day to worship the Lord amen 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 he has blessed us with another wonderful day when we woke up this morning we did not hear the steady march of the chariot wheels from the sky so that means that we are yet among the living on the way to the land of dying how blessed we are to be able to share one with the other. And so we are so delighted to have all of those persons who are joining us by uh, social media and all of those persons who are in person. Let me just say here, we are delighted uh, to have with us today Sister Hattie Foster. Thank you for joining us. Deacon Charles Parker and Sister Vicki Parker all the way from Sylvania, Georgia. Amen. And uh, I want all of those folk in Georgia and the surrounding areas to meet me at the New Robins Branch Baptist Church at 7.30 on Tuesday evening. And if the Lord says so, and he's always willing, it's us that are weak. And so we will see you there. And we are calling for all of those persons in the area. We are calling for Newington, Oliver, Hiltonia, Rocky Ford, Millen, Swainsboro, Statesboro. We are calling for Savannah. Savannah, Augusta, Franklin, Springfield, amen, amen. We're looking for all of those persons to come and share with us in the Georgia area uh, on the next week, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. And um, and brother and, and Deacon Charles Parker, get the get get my therapist ready. Amen, because I, I need to go and get some therapists, uh, Sister Adrian, and uh, I get therapists on the late, you know, twisting my wrist. Amen. So he's going to get my therapist ready, and I'll see him in the morning. Amen. Amen and amen. Amen. We're delighted to have Deacon Charles and Sister Vicki Parker all the way from Sylvania, Georgia. Sister Betty Trimble, we're looking forward to seeing you all the way from Statesboro, Georgia. Reverend Valrita Davis, amen. We are delighted to have Sister Barbara Cherry uh, joined us this morning. We ask you would continue to keep her in prayer who lost her mother on yesterday. And so we are going to keep her in prayer. Amen. Uh, she's online today wanting to know, is there any word from the Lord? Amen. Amen. And Sister Claude, uh, uh, Brother Claude Wells is on board. Uh, Sister Tiffany Barrett is on board. Delighted to see you. Sister Dollar Robinson Jacks is on board. D uh, delighted to have Brother June Coe on board. Delighted to have Reverend Minister Wilhelmina Haskins on board. Board. Amen. Brother Stevie Leo is on board. Welcome, Brother Leo. Delighted to have you on board. Welcome, Sister Sandra Johnson. Jack Max is on board. Amen. Welcome, Sister Sheila Adams is on board. Welcome, Sister Rebecca Dickerson 
uh, Johnson is on board. Brother Isaiah Martin is on board. We're delighted to have all of those persons who are on board and who are sharing with us today. Amen. What a blessed time in the name of the Lord. What a wonderful time and what a wonderful thing it is to be able to worship the Lord in spirit and in truth. And we welcome each and every one of you. Amen. Welcome Sister Shay Ray all the way from Middletown, Delaware. Amen. Amen. We are delighted to have you, and we are delighted to have all of those persons who've been away for a little bit, and they are back. We ask your continued prayers for those who are experiencing difficulties in our world. We live in a world where all kinds of things has happened. We ask your continued blessings for Sister Talissa and her family uh, as they were, they were, her son was playing basketball and uh, football and uh, everybody in the area, and there was a shooting in the area where they all heard the shots. And so we ask you that, uh, that you would pray their strength in, uh, in the Lord, and that the, um, they would continue to be pr protected and, uh, amen, undergirded with his spirit. Amen. Delighted to have Sister Stacy Casper Smith on board. Delighted to have you, Sister Ray Cook. Delighted to have Sister Pamela Saunders on board, all the way from Glenside, Pennsylvania. Amen and amen. All right, uh, let us stand. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof the world and they that dwell therein. Lift up your heads, O ye gates, even lift them up, ye everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord of hosts, he is the King of glory. All right, a congregational hymn. Let us sing with uplifted voices. Joyce. 
thing that will be when we all see Jesus. We will sing and shout the victory when we all. Amen. All right, our scripture lesson uh, uh, this morning comes from uh, Romans chapter 12, and uh, you will find words similar to these. Amen. Romans chapter 12, we'll begin at verse number 1. And let me, let me just say that uh, for a moment, uh, pause for a moment to all of those persons, all of those newer members uh, during the church school hour, you will see me uh, in the conference room to my left, Sister Gail and Brother Harris, amen. You can see me to your left. All right, Romans chapter 12 and verse number one. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God, the Word of God. Oh, Father God, in the name of Jesus we come. We come this morning thanking and praising you for all your goodness and your mercy. Yeah. We thank you, O oh God, for letting us see a day that we have never, ever seen before. Oh God, we just come this morning to offer our praise to your name. Father God, we thank you for what you've already done, and we thank you for what you're going to do. Father, I ask in the name of Jesus that you would open our hearts and open our minds that we receive the word. And as we receive the word, we'll leave this this place with a joy that we will go and tell somebody Jesus loves you and Jesus will save you. Father, we just come this morning, some with a bow down head and an empty heart, but God, you know every situation and every problem in this place. Yeah. You said that no weapon formed against us would prosper. No weapon against our sisters. No weapon against our brothers. No weapons against our brothers and our mothers. Oh God, we come this morning and we all offer you a sacrifice of praise. Yeah. Oh God, touch us in a special way. Protect us in a special way that as we walk these streets of Philadelphia, oh God, that the blood of Jesus would flow and will continue to be strong in you. These and all of the blessings we ask in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Amen.
Say, Lord, you're worthy. Lord, you're worthy. And we give you the praise. And we give you the praise. Lord, you're worthy. Lord, you're worthy. And we give you the praise. And we give you the praise. You're always making a way. Always making a way. And we give you the praise. And we give you the praise. Lord, you're worthy. Lord, you're worthy. And we give you the praise. And we give you the praise. Lord, you're awesome. Lord, you're
How many know he's worthy? Now don't fool me now. Did you come to praise him? Because there's going to be some praising in heaven. And if you can't do it down here now, then what you doing? We're going to talk about that. Amen. Good morning. Good morning, Second Mount Zion. I'm going to wake y'all up, hopefully. Amen. Our Sunday school lesson, our Sunday school lesson this morning is taken from Revelation. Revelation chapter 22, and we will look at verses 1 through 7, and our key verse is going to be verse 1. Revelation 1 through 7, key verses 1, and as you're getting there, our title will be No Better Refreshment. No Better Refreshment. A few announcements before we get started. We ask that if you are sending any mail or correspondence such as ties, that you would please send them to our post office box, which is P.O. Box 41839, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, 19101. And for those of you who are in person, please use the tithing box in the back of the church. Uh, we urge you that there is no eating or drinking in the sanctuary. If you'd have to do so, please excuse yourself. Go into the lobby way and follow the directions of our ushers. Uh, and then we have our youth who will be singing on the first Sunday, first Sunday of the month, and they will rehearse the Saturday before the first Sunday at 1030 here at Second Mount Zion. Amen. I told you I'm going to get it one of these Sundays. Amen. Our sick and our shut in, please contact the church if you or your family member becomes ill. Uh, we want to shout out to Sister Laura Kennerly as she is recovering uh, in a rehab facility. We wish her a speedy recovery. And we also do want to acknowledge the passing of Sister Cherry Barbara Cherry's usher, Barbara Cherry's mother. Amen. We want you to keep those in prayer. Amen. All right, Revelation, Revelation. Revelation is an interesting book. Many people tend to want to shy away from the book of Revelation because of its imagery and symbolisms and things that you, you read in it. Some people consider it scary. And I will declare that for some it probably will be scary. But for the believer, it should not be scary. It's a book that should encourage you for the believer. For the believer, it tells you what awaits you. For both the believer and the unbeliever. Because if you're an unbeliever or if you're one that hasn't been, it tells you what your future awaits you. That's the certain death, the second death. But for the believer, it tells you of a reward or what's to come. So I think that this book, really, you shouldn't let it you shouldn't shy away from it or let it scare you because as mystical as the book of Revelation is perceived it is a book of promises many people avoid it because of its complex symbolisms and frightening imageries of the end of time and, and we kind of buy into this mysticism about the book those who do talk about it tend to focus on judgment and the awaiting uh, of the un unrepentant world. From an unbeliever's perspective, the prophecy and revelation is horrifying. So if you're an unbeliever, yes, it should scare you, and that's its purpose. While one of Revelation's purpose is to stir the non-believer's repentance, this is only half of the pictures. As believers, we should read Revelation as an exciting finale to an epic story. It is... It is the revelation that God will fulfill his promise to destroy sin once and for all, which you find in Genesis 3.15, after the fall of man, and redeem his creation. It's the moment Satan and, Satan and Jesus finally go uh, head to toe or head up, and Jesus defeats evil, bringing everlasting joy and peace. Stick a pen in everlasting joy. Re Re Revelation is the only book in the Bible that motivates his reader by promises a blessing to those who read and obey it. You get a blessing to, you just got blessed today if you read it. But it says read and obey. So you got to obey. We'll talk about obey. But it's a curse to those who tamper with it. When you look at Revelations 22, I didn't give you this, uh, Green. Revelations 22:18 and 19, there's a warning in it. 
there's a warning. Revelations 22, 18 and 19 says, I warn everyone who hears the word of the prophecy of this scroll. If anyone adds anything to them, God will add to that person the plague described in the scroll. And if anyone takes words away from this scroll, the prophecy, God will take away from that person and share in the tree of life in the holy city, which are described in this scroll. So there is both a warning, but there is a promise. There's a promise. When you look at Revelation, Revelation enumerates seven blessings. The first one, blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy, and I said this, and are blessed of those who hear it. Double blessing, those who read and those who hear it and take the heart which is written in it because time is near. That's Revelation 1.3. Then in 14, 13, he says, then I heard a voice from heaven say, write this, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the spirit, they will rest from their labor and their deeds will follow them. I think Minister Tiffany Curtis asked you Wednesday, are you doing the work? Your deeds will follow you. 1615 says, look, I come like a thief. Blessed is the one who stays awake and remains closed so not to go naked and shamefully exposed. 199 says, then the angel said to me, write this. Blessed are those who are invited to the wedding supper of the lamb. And he has added, these are true words of God. Then 26 says, blessed are those who share in the first resurrection. The second death has no power on them, but they will be priests of God and of Christ and will reign with him for a thousand years. 22, seven, which is in our lesson says, look, I am coming soon. Blessed is the one who keeps the word of this prophecy written in the scroll. And then 22, 14, next week's lesson says, blessed are those who wash their robes that they may have right to the tree of life and go through the gates of the city. So revelation is not this mystified book that's scary. It pronounces blessings, but blessings to those who believe, blessings to those who obey. As Minister Tiffany Curtis says, blessings to those who do the work. She asks you, what is the work? What is the work you are doing? The work you're doing is with your life. John, when he writes his gospel, makes some promises. Jesus makes some statements that he is, the, he is, he is life, he is light. He says all that. John points to Jesus and, and vis-a-vis points to heaven. And so in, in, in John and in the gospel, he writes it. In Revelation, he tells you, he gives you a description of it. And here we find a description of, but before we get there, I just want to read the end of 21. 21 uh, verse 27. Revelations 21, 27. But there shall be by no means, enter, but there shall be by no means enter anything that defiles or causes an abomination or a lie, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. And he's talking about the new Jerusalem. So you can't, you can't expect to, you can't expect to live on earth one type of way and expect to get into heaven another type of way. And the reason is, is because sin is going to be removed. It's going to be a holy city. And so in order to get there, we have to be changed. And so now John, when he, when he describes the city, because first, in 21, he described the city and he told you, he describes this exterior, he told you about the walls, he told you everything. In 22, now he goes in and he looks at the city and he describes it. And again, with the symbolisms, he says, he showed me the river, a pure river, water of life, clear as crystal proceeding of the th- out of the throne of God and the lamb. So here we find in this, what's so important about a river? What's so important about water? Glad you asked. If you read the news, there's a controversy on the West Coast, the Colorado River, which starts up here in these kind of northern states, Northwest, and it flows down from Colorado, Wyoming, and it flows all the way down and goes into LA, into California. And from that river, it feeds all these different states. And it's good for it. They need it for, for drinking water, for agricultural purposes. But the Colorado River, due to climate change, is starting to dry up. And so now 
you find because it's drying up, they can't water their crops. So now food is becoming scarce. Water is becoming scarce that they have to conserve water. And they're fearing that it will continue to dry up. And guess what? Without water, it's hard to live. Your bodies are what, 60% water, 50% male, female, right? I told you last week that when they go to explore other, when they go to explore in space, the first thing they look for is water because water symbolizes life. And so this water, you know, we always have a problem. Think about it. When you get thirsty, you drink. You know, like Pastor Moore says, when y'all drink that wine, I mean, uh, the grape juice, I mean, I'm sorry. And after y'all finish, y'all go, ah. <laughs> Grape juice, grape juice, Vaughn. Because it has refreshing qualities. But guess what? About an hour later, what's going to happen? You're going to be thirsty again. And you're going to have to do it all over again. So in this side of Zion, refreshment is temporary. But God declares that he's going to give you a water that's different. What does he say to the woman at the well? In John 4, 13 through 14. Because he talks about water and he meets her where he's at, but then he transitions. And she says, where can I get this water? And Jesus said to her, whoever drinks of this water will thirst again. You're going to get thirsty again. I'm kind of thirsty right now. Mouth getting dry. But whoever drinks the water that I shall give him will never thirst. But the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up to everlasting life. What if you never had to worry about how you're going to get your water? What does water do? It satisfies. The symbolism of water is a spiritual life only received from God through Jesus Christ. It's salvation. It's satisfaction. It's refreshing. I just told you that. It's refreshing. It symbolizes God's presence and his eternal blessings. So water is so necessary, but God says, I'll take care of that when you get to heaven. Y'all get that. But look at the qualities of the water. It's clear as crystal or transparent. Now, you know, how many of y'all will go down to the Delaware and drink the Delaware water or the school kill, school kill punch, right? Why not? It's dirty. When you look at it, it looks a little brownish, right? And God knows what else is in that, in that water, right? But when you see a, when you, when you see, if you ever see a spring, hence where they get spring water, it's clear, some of them, you got to read the bottle carefully. But the spring is clear, not only is it clear, but it's constantly moving, which means it doesn't become stagnant. And so, so when you see a water, he says crystal clear, clear as crystal, it's transparent nature. So when you get to heaven, things are transparent. How many of y'all could use some transparency in this life? How many could use some transparency from government? Mm. So the, the river's qualities is that it's continuing, but look what it sources. Ezekiel in his vision sees a river, but in his vision, the river comes from the temple. In this, the river comes from who? Its source is God and the God and Jesus sitting on it, giving life. He says, I came to give you life, but not only that, more abundantly. In the midst of it, then in the midst of the river, there's the tree of life. Remember back in Genesis, they had access to the tree of life. But remember when she ate from the, the tree of knowledge of good and evil, they got kicked out and they could not eat from the tree of life. Why? because sin entered to them and they would live immorally as sinful in a sinful nature. That's why God had to kick them out. 
but now he's restoring the curse. And what does he say? I put the tree there. Whenever you have a river, the river is a source of life, and then the river feeds things and trees can grow. And what happens with trees? Trees produce fruit. What happens when they produce fruit? You can eat that. But not only will it produce fruit, it will also produce its leaves. In Ezekiel's vision, the leaves were good for medicine. In this vision, the leaves are good for healing of the nation. So this river, this fruit is constant provision. You won't have to worry about going to the market and what you're going to eat. Because I know some of y'all thinking right now, what am I going to eat for dinner? Which store am I going to? Where am I going to get takeout at? Some of y'all. Maybe none of y'all. But in heaven, it's going to be constant provision that flows. So the tree of life symbolizes the complete reversal of the curse. Together, the, tree, the, river, the river of life and the tree of life symbolize the abundant life that Christ came to give. John 10.10. 10. And John, again, he, he promises this. What does he say? He says, a thief does not come except to steal and kill and to destroy. I have come that they, they may have life and they have it more abundantly. And Revelation shows you the fulfillment of this. Who's the they? The they could be you if you obey. And so this is why, Minister Curtis, we do the work on this side of Zion. So that when we get there, we can be refreshed. We, we, we can have our provisions. We won't have to worry. But you got to do the work now. Are you doing the work? I mean, you showed up today. That's part of it. But he says you got to obey. So we see this, the, the symbolisms of water symbolizing uh, spiritual salvation and refreshment. Now, let me back up and say, let me give you my, uh, my lesson triangle. The situation in this lesson is the river of life. The complication is going to be being unprepared. The gospel solution will be to obey God's words. And you see that throughout this. And the aim, this is what I want y'all to do is to live in a state of readiness. Live in a state of readiness. Are you ready? Because he says he's coming back and he's coming back soon, but no man knows the hour. So if he comes back tonight, are you ready? Don't, don't answer that. But you can get ready. Take advantage of the time that you have. And why should you do this? Because this is all that you get. He shows you all you get, all this healing, all, all, that, all these things that you get. Then he says, he continues to, to describe this, this new heaven, new Jerusalem. And he says, there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and of the lamb will be in it and his servants will serve him. Now notice a few things. First of all, when you get to heaven, don't think you're going to stop worshiping. Worship is part of it. And sir, I know y'all don't like that word serve, but you're still going to do some serving. But notice that when he talks about God and he talks about Christ, he talks about him singularly. He says, and they shall serve him. So we're going to be serving and serving. It has a connotation of worship. So there'll be some worship. So I guess if you ain't a worshiper here, yeah, what you gonna do when you get there? I think you better start, I think they call this like a dress rehearsal. I think we better start practicing now because you, you're, going, you're going to be doing some worship, amen? So you better start learning how to clap your feet and try to keep the beat, clap your hands, stop your feet, learn some words. Yeah. Worship. But then look at, look at how different this new heaven is because he says, and they, that they could be you, 
shall see his face and his names will be on their forehead. Remember in the Old Testament, seeing God face to face wasn't possible. And if you did, it was certainly death. When God came to talk to Moses, he could not see him, right? But now we'll be different. And why will it be different? Because when we get to our new home, we're going to be new people. John in his epistles, 1 John 3, 2, kind of explains it. He says, beloved, now we are children of God and it has not yet been revealed what shall be. But we know that when it, he is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. So these corrupt bodies will put on immortality, incorruption, and we will be able to see him face to face. Now that should motivate you right there to be able to fellowship with, with God and his son and see him face to face. That should make you shout right there. You'll be able to, so really what John is describing is a, a new version of Eden, a restoration of Eden. Remember, they had fellowship with God. They were able to fellowship with him and they had everything that they needed until that they ate from that tree and then they were cursed. But the curse shall be reversed. They'll be able to see him. There'll be no more night and there'll be no more need for candle. No more sun. We don't need the sun. We won't have to be dependent on other things. And what does it mean to be no more night? Now, back in the day, I'm sounding old now, but most of the time, you know, bad things happen at night. I remember Herm Edwards, who was a coach, said, you get you one car, you get you one woman, and you come in before midnight. Because the, the thought was after at night, that's when bad things happen because people could hide behind the cloak of darkness. Well, now it's like midnight all day because bad things happen during the day. But the concept of what he's saying is that if there's no night, that means there's no, we ain't got to worry about something bad happening. We don't have to be afraid. It's just going to be light. And he said, and they, the they could be you, will reign forever and ever. So we won't have to worry about the curse. We'll worship with him and we'll see him face to face. That's good news for some of y'all. I don't know if y'all are in the day. But then he promised the certainty of it, and he says, these things are faithful and true of the, of, of, of the Lord God and the prophets. And he showed his things, which must be done shortly. And here's the warning. He says, behold, I come quickly. Blessed is he that keep the sayings of the prophecy of this book. There is a blessing for hearing for reading, hearing, keeping. Can you do all three? Yeah, it's getting quiet. Now, I know you can read. Or maybe I'll just go out and limp and say, y'all can read. And Minister Tiffany Curtis said, if you couldn't read, then you just download that U version of the Bible and it'll talk to you. So even if you can't read, it'll read to you. So there's your blessing if you read it. Amen. Can you read? Can you hear it? Because hearing comes with the connotation of obeying. If you can read it, hear it, which means internalize it, and then you got to keep it. Can you, can you do all three? You, all, you, you got to do all three. If you want your, see, you don't, you, you don't want to walk away half blessed because there is a such thing. You might miss out on some stuff, but if you can complete, complete, the, complete it, read it, hear it, keep it, guess what awaits you? Everlasting life. You won't have to worry about nothing. God will just provide everything that you need, and all you got to do is worry about worshiping. Hallelujah. That's the angels up there saying right now, hallelujah. 
Hallelujah. And just in case something go wrong, you can pick from that tree and rub it on you. And even if ain't nothing going wrong, you can pick from that tree and be preventive medicine. But that's what awaits, that's what awaits the believer. This is what awaits your fate. Are you excited about that? I know you're excited. I know you want to get there. But in order to get there, you have to do something. Read it, hear it, obey it. What are you going to do? I know it's quiet. But this week, take some time to read it. And if you don't feel like reading it, you know, in that you version, the guy who talked to you, he got this nice English voice that's so soothing. <laughs> right? Nice English guy. Let him read to you. And even words you can't pronounce, he'll help you pronounce those words. So read it, hear it, and then obey it or keep it. Amen. That's our lesson for today. <laughs> Next week, we'll close out our study of Revelation, and we'll, we'll close out our study, and we'll look at, uh, we'll finish this, uh, this chapter 22 up. And let me just say that when you look at Revelation chapter 22, when you get to verse 6, that becomes the epilogue for the whole for the book of Revelation, or it's, it, it wraps up in its conclusion. So we'll look at the epilogue and its conclusion of Revelation. Amen. Praise and worship team. Thank you. The Lord is high above the heavens. The Lord is high above the heavens. Hey. Hey. And there's glory above the nation. And there's glory above the nation. Give God the 
highest praise, acknowledge him and always, and all the people sing halle, halle, halle.
Sing hallelujah. Sing hallelujah. We're singing hallelujah. Sing hallelujah. We're singing hallelujah. Sing hallelujah. We're singing hallelujah. Sing hallelujah. Thank you, choir, for singing to the glory of God. What a blessing it is to praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. One thing I like about the Lord, you don't have to do the same thing every Sunday the same way. And I feel led to do a ministry moment. We got so much going on in our world today. Young kids being exposed to violence and the sound of a gun. What do you say?
parents, we got to make sure that we tell our children how much we love them. Amen. We got to let them know that they are safe in our arms and they are safe around the people in whom we bring around them. We got to allow them to know that we can't allow violence and evil to stop them from being children and to grow up as normal as possible. And we have to make sure that we allow them to grow up and make them know that we can't stop because of what evil folk do. And I reflect on a scripture that I preached from the other Sunday, John chapter 5. And I want to look at verse number 2, from verse number 2. Listen. Now there was in Jerusalem by the sheep gate a pool which is called in the Hebrew Bethesda, having five porches. In these lay a great multitude of sick people, blind, lame, paralyzed, waiting for the moving of the water. For an angel went down at a certain time into the pool and stirred up the waters. Then whosoever steps in first after the stirring of the waters was made well of whatever disease he had. Now a certain man and whenever the Bible say a certain person, you can always put your name there. A certain, when he doesn't give a specific name, a certain man was there who had an infirmity 38 years. I don't know what your problem is today. I don't know what your issues are. I don't know what your concerns are. And our concerns are many. And so we want to do a special altar call for everybody because everybody have issues. And if you have no issues now, it's just a matter of time before you do. And, and this, these, all of these people represents different ailments and different issues. And so we're going to ask Minister Tiffany Curtis if she would come and pray for us and pray for all of those issues that concerns us today and put your name in the scripture. You are, your name goes where the certain person is. So whatever it is, know that the Lord sees you. Because the text goes on to say, he passed by and he saw a man that was lame for 38 years. I don't know how long you've been in your situation, but I want you to know without the shadow of a doubt that Jesus sees you right where you are. Minister Curtis. Remember me. Remember. 
it's all right. It's all right if you come down. It's all right if you walk down. It's all right. We come, God, saying, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Yeah, Lord. Thank you, Lord, because you've been so good. Thank you, God, you've been so good because you've made a way over and 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 over again. God, your word in the book of Isaiah says, God, that you will give us beauty for ashes, God. Yeah. That you would give us joy for mourning, God. Woo. And God, that you would give us a garment of praise for our heaviness, God. Mm -hmm. God, now you don't say that the heaviness will be removed, God, but then on top of the heaviness, God, we are to put on a garment of praise. Yeah, Lord. God, so as we continue and praising you on this morning, God, we take time to say thank you, God. God, we thank you for our pastor, God, for the man of God that you have placed at this branch of Zion, God, for over 36 years. God, we ask that you will continue to anoint him and touch him, God, from the top of his head to the sole of his feet, God. God, that you will make a way out of no way, God, that you will provide every need, God, every care, God, that as he continues to pour out and out onto those who you have placed our spirits in his care, God, that you would take care of him, God. God, that even in the midnight hour, God, that you will be there. We cover his family right now, God, in the name of Jesus. God, we cover the leadership of Second of Mount Zion, God, in the name of Jesus. Yeah. The deacons, the trustees, God, all of the ministry leaders, God, the choir, the music ministry, God, the, all that are under your calling, God, who have been called to the specific uh, 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 statuses that you have anointed and appointed them for, God. Mm -hmm. God, we come before you heavy. Lord, right now, in the name of Jesus, we ask, God, that you would forgive us of any and all sins that we have committed against you, God, so that this prayer would not be hindered, God. God, we go into our secret closets, God, and whatever that, that sin is that has a name, God, we cast it to you, God, knowing that you care about it, God. And once we repent, God, and ask that you forgive us of it, God, and turn from our wicked ways, that you would hear it, God, in the name of Jesus, and forgive. God, we ask right now that you would hear our prayer, God, that you would hear our cries, God, that you would accept this, this plea, God, in the name of Jesus, yeah, the plea for our families, God, in the name of Jesus, for those that don't know you, God, that they will come to know you, God, genuinely, God, and even those that think they know you, but God, you don't know them. Mm -hmm that you would know them, Father, in the name of Jesus. God, we plead for our neighborhoods, God, specifically, God, the 5700 block of Haverford, God, in the name of Jesus. God, we ask in the name of Jesus that even though things happen, God, and we don't understand why, God, we don't know why we have to have the exposure, God, that you will remind us that your ways are so much higher than our ways, that your thoughts are higher than our thoughts, God, that as the heavens are further from apart from the earth, so are your ways and your thoughts. And we will trust you, God. Yeah, Lord. In the name of Jesus, we will trust you, God. We will lean not to our own understanding, but in all our ways acknowledge you, knowing that you will direct our path just as you have until now, God. God, we lift up Talissa, God. We lift up Cameron, God, in the name of Jesus. We lift up Dion Hyatt, God. We lift up Valerie Mann, God, in the name of Jesus. All those that live in the neighborhood, God, we lift them up in the name of Jesus. We lift up Westfully, God. We lift up Northfully, God. We lift up the Northeast, God. We lift up Yaden, God. We lift up Mount Airy, God. We lift yeah. up all of Philadelphia and Vicinity, God, in the name of Jesus. God, we would that gun violence will be abolished in the name of Jesus. God, but we trust you. We know, God, that we ask things, and if it's your will, then it will be done. But if it's not, God, grant us peace. That's a passive all understanding, God, to continue to survive and live in a world, God, that we don't always understand and we don't know why. 
God, I lift up every single financial burden, God, in the name of Jesus, God, that those who know you would do the work, God, that they would tithe, God, that they would sacrifice and give them themselves, God, and that you would bless them abundantly, God, because of it. God, I ask that you allow us to engage in self-introspection and reflection, God, that you would show us us. And God, even if you show us us and there's some things about us yeah. that we don't like, God, that we don't love, God, that you will show us you on the inside of us so that we would love you, God. We love you, God. We love you, God, that we would love you, God, even more than spouses and children, God, and mothers and fathers, God, and things and jobs, God, in the name of Jesus, that you would get the glory. God, we renounce every idol, God, everything that we've placed above you, God, in the name of Jesus. We cover the ministry, God, that you have anointed and appointed, pastor for at this branch of Zion, God, that you will do a new thing, God, that you will do something that has never seen, been done before, God, or seen in this neighborhood, God, in this community, God, in the name of Jesus. We lift up our elderly, God, our seniors, God, that as they get older, God, and their minds don't work like they used to, God, that they look in the mirror and don't always recognize the people that look back, God, that you would cover and keep them, God. That their minds will continually be stayed on you, God, in the name of Jesus. God, that you will pull down every stronghold, God, and cast down every argument and every high thing, God, that exalts itself against the knowledge of you, God. Uh -uh. That you will bring every thought in our mind captive unto obedience unto you, God. God, for we love you and we do, but we are still questioning and wondering and doubting, God. Some of us are sick in our bodies, God, and the doctors don't know what's wrong. They've been trying to figure it out, God. God, we ask that we will come to you, God, the ultimate doctor. God, that you would anoint and appoint, God, the, the surgeons, God, and the physicians, God, and all of those that come to do with arthritis, God, in the name of Jesus, and diabetes, God, and high blood pressure, God, that you would allow the medicine that is, that is prescribed, God, to be that which will cater to the need, God, in the name of Jesus. The God, we lift up the prison system, God, and we continue, God, just to love on you, God, to thank you, God, for this time, God, to cast every care upon you, knowing, God, that you care for us. We ask, God, that all of these things will be done, God, in the name of Jesus, that you will take us to deeper depths and higher heights, God, for your glory, God. For your glory, God, for your glory. As we close, God, we continue, God, to put on a garment of praise for the heaviness that is on our hearts. In the name of Jesus, we do pray. Amen. 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 Amen and amen.
amen, amen, and amen. God is still good, and his mercy is everlasting, and his truth endureth to all generations. Amen. We are delighted today. We are second Mount Zion is so blessed today. We are blessed to have colleagues and friends who could stop in and share with us the gifts that God has deposited in them. And this morning we are delighted to have Dr. Marshall Woodard Brown with us today. Amen. Dr. Brown is a man. She serves currently she serves as a man, the, the director of supervised ministries, academic advisor, and senior lecturer of Christian ministry of the Palmer Theological Seminary. Amen. She not only serves there, but she serves as the educational director of the Pennsylvania Eastern Keystone Baptist Association. She not only serves there, but she serves as the first vice president of the Baptist Pastors and Ministers Conference of Philadelphia and Vicinity. And then she serves as the associate minister at the Saints Memorial Baptist Church in Bryn Mawr, Pennsylvania. And you are in for a treat. The choir is going to give me a, a, about, a, about a quarter of a something that will get her in the move and the next voice that you will hear will be that of Dr. Marsha Woodard Brown. Why don't you give her a second Mount Zion welcome. I love 
Oh, I know that folk in here who know that song is their testimony that they love to praise his holy name. It's not just the choir. Some of y'all also love to praise. And we come to worship to praise God. So it is all right to go ahead and praise his name. It's all right to let him know how much we love him, how grateful we are to him, because he is a good God. Yes, he is. Yes, he is. And I am glad and excited to be here on this morning. Yes, I am. And I am grateful for technology. Yes, I am. See, y'all don't know why she's grateful for te technology. Well, she's grateful for technology because just because y'all are just seeing me doesn't mean I didn't already enter the service. I have been in the service all the time. I heard Pastor Moore as he began this morning getting us started. I was listening listening to the Sunday school lesson, even as I was watching on the traffic to make sure I didn't see any flashing lights because my, my, my little speedometer was a little bit over the 55 that's on the school. Well, just a little bit, just a little bit, just a little bit. I, I, I was just thanking God, you know, for all of that. And I'll be thanking him on my way home and following the speed limit. And grateful, grateful for the prayer as I was entering in in the, in the moments of prayer that we were taking time for praying because we live in an age and in a time where we can't get by without prayer. And, and so we come because this time now in the service for a word. Won't you pray with me as we get ready to hear from God? Awesome and wonderful God, you have done more for us than we know to do for ourselves. We don't even know how to thank you for all the things you continually do. The fact, God, that we're in this space is testament to more blessings than we can count this day. You allowed us to wake up. You gave us the ability to get dressed. You provided some clothes for us to put on. You gave us a little bit of food, God, to sustain us. You gave us the ability to get to this place. And even right now, God, you're allowing us to breathe. We can't thank you enough. And so because you bless us beyond measure, we want to bless your name. And we want to live for you, God. So these, your people, have gathered in worship because they want to hear from you. And this preacher, God, asked you to let her decrease and get out of the way that you might speak to the house because they're listening, God, and they seek to serve you. I give you back what you've given to me, praying it to be acceptable in your sight. For you alone are my strength and my redeemer. Amen. Amen. <laughs> so as I was listening, uh, Pastor Moore was reading Romans 12. And that's not where I'm going to stay, but I want to read it out of the message translation because it's going to help us to where we're going to land. We're going to end up in a familiar passage in John. But Romans 12, 1 and 2, in Eugene, Pas Eugene Peterson's The Message says, so here's what I want you to do, God helping you. Take your everyday, ordinary life, your sleeping, eating, going to work, and walking around life, and place it before God as an offering. Embracing what God does for you is the best thing you can do for God. Don't become so well adjusted to your culture that you fit into it without even thinking. Instead, fix your attention on God. You'll be changed from the inside out. Readily recognize what God wants from you and quickly respond to it. Unlike the culture around you, always dragging you down to its level of immaturity. God brings the best out of you develops well-formed maturity in you. 
And I start with that because it's going to found, it's the foundation for where we're going to go in a half a second because we have come to be followers of Christ. And becoming followers of Christ is saying that we're entering into a new life, that we're ready to be different, that we're wanting to, to grow and to live in the world in a different way, in a different way. And yet, because we grew up in the world and we know this world, we've got this tendency to keep doing what we see around us. We, we get this tendency to keep doing what we saw in our household. We don't really do it, take a lot of practice to unlearn, unlearn the ways of the world so we can relearn the ways of God. Unlearn and relearn. Because, see, we serve this God who does crazy things like loving your enemies. That's a crazy thing. We were taught that those folk who don't like us, we ain't supposed to like them either. We were taught that those folk who do wrong to us, we got to figure out a way to do wrong to them. And yet we come into this faith that talks about turning other cheeks and this faith that talks about being kind to those who won't be kind. That's what this Romans 12 is about. It's about being willing to unlearn and pick up some stuff that will seem crazy because it seems unnatural, but it's the way of God. And the reason that's important is because God will sometimes ask you to do something that sounds crazy. God will sometimes give you a crazy assignment. Sometimes when you come to work to do your job and you're ready to do your job the way you've always done it, God will pop in and have you do it differently. And that's why I want you to meet me over in John's Gospel. Because in John's Gospel, there are some folk who came to work on a regular day, and they get a brand new assignment. Not only do they get a brand new assignment, they get a super crazy assignment. They come to work, they're ready to do work the way they've always done it. And their day doesn't go as planned. So you're familiar with the story. It's in John, it's the second gospel. Jesus and his mother and a whole lot of other people have gone to a wedding. And while they're at the wedding, and in that custom, they had real wine at weddings. It wasn't grape juice. It was real wine. And they, and they used it, and they had a lot of it. They went on for days and days, and they were running out of wine. And Jesus' mother, he hasn't done miracles yet. This is at the very beginning. Folks don't know who he is. He doesn't have any reputation, none of that. He is just attendee at the banquet. But his mama knows who he is, and his mama knows what he's capable of, and his mama knows what his mission is. And so his mama says, you can do something about this. It looks like a problem to these other folk, but you can make a difference. And these servants who have come to work, they just being servants. they just taking care of the table. they just doing the work behind the scenes. Nobody knows their name because you don't pay a whole lot of attention to servants. they just sort of in the background. They're there, but they're close enough. They hear this conversation. And Jesus doesn't answer, and his mama just says to the servants, who, she not even their boss. You know. One of them is saying, like, you're not the boss of me. You don't sign my paycheck. But she turns to them and says, whatever he tells you to do, do. Now, you're at work. you got these crazy people who you don't know who are popping in, starting to give orders, and then they took crazy orders. And then this man who you don't know, you maybe saw him on the street, he turns to you, and he tells you to fill those water jars with water and take that to the head of the banquet. Now, you sort of clean your ears out because you think the brother is stupid. The head of the banquet is looking for wine. And you are asking me to put water in this jar and take this water to somebody who is looking for wine 
you must think I am stupid. Or something else they might have said, but at least stupid is what we can say when they're children in the service. <clears throat> God gave them a crazy assignment. God was asking them to do something that did not make sense. God was requiring of them to trust God when they didn't even have any reason for trusting God. There was no track record. They didn't even know who Jesus was. He didn't even have a reputation. And I'm using them because sometimes God is wanting us to carry water to people who are looking for wine. Sometimes God is looking for the church to be the vehicle to take our ordinary everyday substances and offer it to a world that's looking for wine. Sometimes God is asking us to trust that the crazy things he's asking us to do are the very things that the world needs, and it doesn't look like what we have is enough to meet the need. It doesn't look like what we have will get anywhere near fulfilling what they want. But God is saying that our looking like nothing will work, that whatever the equivalent of our water is, that's what God is wanting us to use. And so I like the servants. Because the servants, we don't know their name. We don't know their background or their history. But what we do know is that they were willing to take the step. They were willing to be obedient. Because the text tells us that they filled the jars to the brim with water. The text tells us that they start walking. The text tells us that they get all the way to the head of the banquet. And you, the head of the banquet. And you say that, well, that's not a lot, but that is a whole lot. Because when they don't have any evidence, when they don't have any indication, when all they have is a word, they're willing to step out on the word. When all they have is a word, they're willing to go the next step. When all they have is a word, they're willing to go in the direction that the word has pointed them. And that means that sometimes all we have is a word. All we have is Pastor Moore's vision. All we have is what God has given to Pastor Moore. And all we have is the need to take the step. All we have is the desire. All we have is the chance to take the desire to follow that word that has been given to the angel of the house. We think it's a crazy word. It's a word of something we've never done before. It's a word of something we haven't seen the church around the corner do. It's a word of something we haven't seen the Meccas do on the TV screen. It's a word of something that's not written down any word, but it's the word that the angel of the house has been given. And because we trust that God has sent the angel of the house to this house, then we're like those servants called to be willing to start walking. No explanation, no guarantee. They start walking. And when they get there, I imagine that they had to be thinking, we're going to get laughed out the planet. They had to be thinking, this is going to be my last day at work. Because you know, well, maybe you don't know. Y'all are good Baptist people. But, but, but if you, and I'm a good Baptist person too. And, and while this is not true right now in my life, there was a time in my life I didn't know what wine tastes like. So I do know the difference in good and bad wine. So y'all might not, but trust me, there is a difference in good and bad wine. <laughs> Trust me, they, there's a difference in the stuff that costs some money and the stuff that you can get. There's a difference in the stuff that they keep behind the counter at the store and you got to ask for and the stuff that's readily on the shelf. There, 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 there is a difference. And, and, and so these servants are thinking in their head, when we give this man water, it's all over. We don't have no job. We don't have no reference. <laughs> but they dip in. And they go to give it to him. And I imagine as they go to give it to him, 
that's when they get the first indication that something's happened. Because water that you're going to drink doesn't have a scent to it. If you can start smelling water, you also know you don't want to drink it. And so when they get a whiff, a scent, a something that's pleasant, then they're not sure, but they get a sense that something happened to the water. And then when the head of the banquet starts drinking and he starts saying, <coughs> wow, this is not, as, not, not just wine. This is better wine than we've been drinking all these many days. They know that God has done something. They don't know when God has done it. They don't know how God did it. But they know the fact that now he is testifying about <coughs> good wine is evidence <coughs> of what God has done. Not bad wine, not cheap wine. Exquisite wine is really what the word would have it to be. I wonder what God has in store for Second Mount Zion. I wonder what are the miracles that are just on the edge of happening and all God is waiting for is for Second Mount Zion to be willing to be servants who are willing to trust God. I, I wonder what will happen in Mantua as Second Mount Zion decides we want to be like those servants because if you're like those servants, you'll see a transformation in the community. If you're like those servants, you'll see the world change. <laughs> and it's an important wondering. And the reason it's important is because the head of the banquet doesn't know a miracle occurred. <laughs> the head of the banquet wanted water and got water. I mean, no, he didn't. No, he didn't. He wanted wine and he got wine. The people at the banquet, the invited guests, they didn't even know there was a problem because the wine in their cup hadn't ended up yet. They still had wine in their cup. So they don't even know that there had ever been the hint of a problem. At the end of the day, it's only the servants who know God worked a miracle. And there's some miracles that you only will get to encounter if you're willing to allow God to speak to you and to do things that look out of the ordinary. There's some miracles that you only encounter when you're willing to carry water to folk who are looking for wine. There's some miracles that you don't get to participate in if you want to have all the facts and you want it all drown out. There's some miracles that you only get to see when you're willing to step out on faith and you're willing to go without any evidence and without a lot of explanation. I am coming today just to ask, are you willing to be the kind of congregation that will carry water to folk who are looking to wine? Are you willing to carry the good news of the gospel to a world that is on its way trying to destroy itself? Are you willing to go out and to work for peace in a world that's full of violence? Are you willing to go out and to help those who are caught up in addictions even when they can't hear the word and to walk with them because you believe there will be a time when they will turn again and turn to Jesus. Are you willing to go out and to help those who don't have housing until they have a place to be housed? Are you willing to go into schools and to help and to be there and to help those children be loved? I heard Pastor Moore saying that we have to help our children grow up and still be children in spite of the violence in which they're experienced in the world? Are you the kind of congregation then that's willing to create the kind of activities and the kind of opportunities so that children can yet be children in a world where they're being pushed to grow up so quickly as possible? Are you willing to do the things that aren't in anybody's book, in the things that we don't always have our preparation for? Are you willing to do the stuff that looks crazy because God is calling you 
to be the salt, to be the light, to be the leaven. We live in a different world. It's not the world of our grandparents. It's not the world of our, our, our foreparents. It's not the world of our parents. We don't live in a world where the church is lifted up high and holy. We don't live in a world where the church has great respect. We don't live in a world where it's automatic for people to come to worship on Sunday, whether that's virtual or in person. We don't live in that kind of society anymore. But God has called us to live in this crazy time. The old hymn says, a charge to keep I have, my calling to fulfill. And then the second verse says, to serve this present age. As crazy as the world looks, we've been called to serve this age. So if violence is on a rampage, we're called to serve this age. If crime is happening in our streets and neighborhoods, we're called to serve this age. If children are growing up too quickly, we're called to serve this age. If our school systems is in need of help, we're called to serve this age. If people don't really know God, we're called to serve this age. And if we're called to serve this age, we got to be willing to carry water to people who are looking for wine. Let us pray. God, how we thank you for calling us to be your servants and how we need courage to not become well-adjusted to the society in which we live. We want to be like our neighbors, God. But you call us to be different. Help us to be the salt, the light, the leaven that the world needs. Help us to lay down our ordinary walking around life and to pick up a cross and to run swiftly to follow you. Give us courage, God that we will be willing to carry water to people who are looking for wine. We ask it in the name of the Christ. Amen. There may be some today who've already made a decision. In fact, the truth of the matter is, is that most of the folk in the house have already made a decision for Christ. And so what I want to ask is if you've already made a decision, that you just talk to God for a couple of minutes about what you're going to do with the word, because it says we're accountable for every word we hear. But for those who haven't made the decision, let me talk to you for a few minutes. Initial decision is you just ought to be born into the kingdom, that you ought to be willing to confess that you're a sinner, Acknowledge that you need a savior and that you're willing to live your life for him. That gets you into the kingdom. Angels rejoice in heaven for that. But if you do that, you can't raise yourself. And you need to be a part of a church family. And so you need to publicly do what you've done privately and to publicly come forward and say you want to be a candidate for baptism that you want the world to know you've made an inward decision, that you're willing to go down into the water as a sign of leaving an old life and to be raised up to new life. But maybe you already are a Christian, but you're not in the church where you were baptized. And you've been here, you've been watching online, you've been here in person, and you realize that God is calling you to continue your work and walk in this branch of Zion. So it's a time where you can come on Christian experience. And I know it doesn't happen here, but I know at the Saints Memorial, we have people who were members who sort of drift away. And so every now and then they realize they want to come back home. And so you come on restoration because you realize you've been away from the church so long, you're pretty sure you're on the inactive list. 
So you can come as a candidate for baptism. You can come on Christian experience. You can come for restoration. But as the choir sings, the opportunity is yours to come. The doors are open for Christian discipleship. Somebody here today, he's calling for you. He's keeping the blood running warm in your vein. He's letting the world turn for you. The opportunity is yours and the invitation is extended to you, to you and to you. Would you come? Would you come? Are you willing? to carry water? Are you willing to step out on this crazy assignment of carrying water? If you're willing, would you come forward and say, Lord, I want to be your servant because serving the Lord, serving the Lord will pay off after a while. He's calling for you. He's extending unto you the invitation to Christian discipleship and church membership. God bless you. Let church say amen. amen. Say amen. amen. Say it one more time. Amen. What a what a challenging word. What a challenging word and what an on time word. I don't know about you, but I was certainly blessed and uh, I needed to hear that word because sometimes God calls us to do some crazy stuff. In fact, about it, it's even crazy just to be able uh, just to say the Lord called me in the first place a sovereign God, an infinite God, call a finite person like you and like me. That's crazy within itself. And the reason I know, the reason I know, the reason I know, because there was some folk, there was some folk down home, you know, when, when I first started going back home, Sister Borden, and, uh, <laughs> The lady saw me uptown because the context where I came from, it was not the city, but the town. And, uh, and she said, I heard that one of your mo boys is here in revival. She said, yes. I said, yes. And she said, which one? I said, James. And uh, she said, now, which one are you? And I said, and I said, James. She said, oh, no, 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 no. You must mean Lester. You must mean Harry. <laughs> you don't mean James. So it's, it, it was just crazy to say that the Lord had called me to preach. Amen. Amen. It's tithing and giving time. What kind of giver does the Lord love? Amen. We are ready to give, and if you have not taken the opportunity to place your offering in the uh, tithing box, you can do so at this time, and if you do not have an envelope, you can raise your hands, and the ushers will be sure that you get one, and, uh, and all the ushers have envelopes today. All of them. All of them. Amen. Not just one of them. <laughs> <laughs> amen, amen. Amen, Sister Lisa Duckett, good to see you. All the way from Mantua. Uh, 
everybody taking the opportunity to give I got this little secret I got a little secret I'm gonna let you in on all right I'm gonna let you in on the secret well maybe I should oh okay all right yeah I don't like I don't like for folks to start telling me nothing and then uh, then actually all right, y'all kind of lower it down a little bit now because I don't want nobody to miss this. Uh, actually, I, I gave Dr. Woodard the wrong date. I gave her next week instead of this weekend. And I, and I, and I called her, and it suddenly dawned upon me because she's not a person that's normally late, and it certainly dawned on me. I said, maybe I told her the fourth Sunday. I think I did. And because I'm used to not being here on the fourth Sunday, and uh, the third Sunday was my last Sunday, and uh, and I'm so programmed in. That's how come you got to transform. And uh, and so uh, I told her the fourth Sunday, and I was looking for her today, and all of a sudden she wasn't there. But I called her. She said, "Give me an hour, and I'll be here." And in an hour, she was here, and and ready to preach. And, and, and what, a, what a blessing it was. And she uh, certainly delivered unto us a powerful word and, and a challenging word. And so we, we were just delighted to have her today and to uh, share with us. And if everybody is satisfied and everybody has taken an opportunity to give, she's going to come back now and give us her final remarks and benediction. And that was a secret I would have taken to my grave. Because <laughs> your pastor is my brother. <laughs> and there are so many times uh, for which he has saved me. I am so grateful to the, the Reverend James Moore that anything that I can do, I'm going to try to do. And a little thing like a mix-up in the date isn't even a thing. Because what happens when you get called to preach, or at least when I got called to preach, and what my father in the gospel said, is that you ought to be ready at any time. And when I got called, we did not have iPads. And we didn't have little devices. So that often meant just trying to keep something on a note card in the Bible. But I have lived long enough to now that we have iPads. And so it's really easy now, somebody calls, because there is something there that you can begin with. Uh, so I am just grateful that, that you remembered enough time to call and that you didn't just sit here <laughs> and nod and then see me in conference next week and say, how come I didn't show up? <laughs> uh, I am grateful to have been here and grateful to be hanging out with Second Mount Zion. And as we stand for the, uh, the benediction, I equally thank you all for the support that you give to your pastor and the support that you give to us. The conference meets here every week and we know we're able to do that because you are a congregation that is supportive of your pastor. And so on behalf of President Wright and all of our officers, I equally extend our thanks as the Baptist Pastors and Ministers Conference of Philadelphia and Vicinity to you for allowing us to hang out in this place each week. Now let's look to the Lord. God, how we thank you for meeting us here. How we thank you for meeting us each and every day of our lives. And God, we leave this place, but we're so grateful that we don't leave your presence. 
So go now, knowing that Jesus is going before you, is able to keep you from falling, and is going to present you faultless at the right hand of his Father. Go in God's peace. Amen. Amen.